It's that time again guys, welcome back for another video. We're well into 2024 already, and the new JRPG releases are not showing any sign of slowing down. And even with some of the big hitters already releasing, there are still many RPGs that I am personally looking forward to this year, and here they are in no particular order. And we're starting with one that we're not going to have to wait too much longer for in Unicorn Overlord, releasing on March the 8th. In fact, come this video's release, it would have just come out. I haven't played the demo as I want a full-on experience, but I've been hearing great things from many sources and the collector's edition has also been locked in for when that time comes. What surprised me though is that the demo is around 7 hours long, at least according to the circles I'm in, and for a first impression, that's generous. That just says to me that Vanillaware are very confident in this game and what it offers as a tactical RPG. First teased through a small clip with the Aegis Rim Prologue demo disc, Unicorn Overlord is the realisation of an idea spawned a decade prior, with development starting way back in 2014. Taking place in the land of Fevriv, the plot follows the exiled Prince Alain as he gathers an army from across the Five Kingdoms to reclaim his throne from General Valmore. You guide Elaine across an overworld to enter towns, use services such as blacksmiths and merchants to outfit his army, and engage in story or optional battles. The battles themselves are split between movement of troops across the land and combat when two units meet. All combat takes place in real time, but the player can pause to change their strategy and check on units. As always, it also supports the ever-recognisable artistic style of Vanillaware to bring the world to life. Unicorn Overlord has been designed as a modern revival of classic tactical games from the 90s like Final Fantasy Tactics and Tactics Ogre. And even though I have no personal experience with those titles, I'm not averse to the draw of a tactical game. It also helps that Vanillaware have been involved with one of my favourite story-driven experiences ever conceived in Aegis Rim, so I'm hoping it will be more of the same from this one. Next up is another title that I'm sure needs no explanation in Eden Chronicle 100 Heroes. It's had a great deal of fanfare even before the Kickstarter began, which was highly successful, may I add. Eden Chronicle 100 Heroes has been coined as the spiritual successor to one of the most influential JRPG franchises ever developed in Suikoden, so it's going to have a high amount of pressure put upon it in order to maintain that legacy. But so far, everything looks promising, with the game due out on April the 23rd. Set on the continent of Olran, the land's history has been shaped by diplomacy and war birthed through the various civilizations that inhabit it. One, however, stands above the rest in the Gaudian Empire, who has discovered a technology that amplifies the so-called Rune Lens magic, meaning that they hold a military advantage over all nations. The Empire is currently scouring the continent to find an artifact that will compound that power even further. And it is on one such expedition that a young and gifted Imperial officer and a boy from a remote village meet each other and become friends. Humble beginnings that I would assume eventually transform into a world-faring adventure. What is not to love about that? You then add on its combat, the massive birth of playable characters and its gripping art style. I'll be shocked if this isn't a hit come the end of 2024. As will I be shocked if its original influencer isn't a success either. Next up is the HD remaster bundle for Suikoden 1 and 2. With the first game originally coming west in 96 and 97 respectively for both America and Europe, Suikoden 1 sees the son of a general seek out 108 heroes to overthrow a tyrant, while Suikoden 2, released in 1999 and 2000 for the same regions, has players join a couple of friends as they become embroiled in a conflict between two kingdoms. Of course, this remastered duo got delayed to 2020. And as of the time of recording, there have been no further updates on its eventual release window. Even so, there is no reason why this should fail. I've never played the originals, I got into JRPGs after the PS1, but I've always respected the legacy and influence of Suikoden as a series, with the second game in particular being touted as one of the greatest RPGs ever made, standing in a pantheon among other titles like Xenogears and Final Fantasy VI. Of course, when I saw it was getting this remaster, and thereby I would finally get the chance to play it for myself on modern hardware, I was jumping for joy. There is evidently a reason for the praise it garners among JRPG circles, and if this is simply a HD remaster of the first two games, then what made the original so special should still be there. Maybe add a few quality of life features to bring it up to modern standards, and there might be some coding challenges to bring it in line with the new engine, but the foundation is done. Konami have to do very little to this game to see it succeed. But that's still my biggest worry, to be honest. The only one who can cause the collection to fail is Konami themselves, and they don't have an amazing track record in recent years when it comes to games. I just hope they won't botch it with this one. Suikoden and the recently deceased Muriyama deserve that at least. 
Next up is yet another title that I don't think requires any explanation. It was revealed right near the end of 2023, and it drew eyes almost immediately. I'm referring to the action RPG Visions of Mana releasing this summer. Originally teased back in 2021, it's the first mainline title since Dawn of Mana, and also sees the return of various alumni to the project. Set in a fantasy world, we join the journey of Val, a young man from a remote village. When his childhood friend is chosen to go on a pilgrimage to the sacred mana tree, which controls the flow of mana throughout the world, Val is charged with accompanying her as a protector. And as of yet, that's our premise. Go out, brave adventurer, and complete your quest. Now, since it's only recently been revealed, we haven't seen too much of Visions of Mana gameplay-wise, but the latest trailers from 2024 point to a solid offering. Vibrant colour palette, as befits the Mana series, simple premise, and seemingly tight action-based gameplay. While I don't expect it to be the best game I'll play this year, I do think it will end up as a highlight come the close of 2024. Now the next one caught my attention very quickly, and I think it went under the radar for many. It's a turn-based RPG called Bloomtown, a different story, and it's releasing in Q2 this year. Combining both life sim and monster taming elements, the game is set in a town reminiscent of 1960s America called Bloomtown. While it looks cosy on the surface, it is merely a front for what lurks beneath, and players take control of Emily as children start to mysteriously disappear. The game utilises the power of inner demons to do battle, but will also combine that with traversal of the town itself to grow stronger over time. It's just got that look and feel about it. I'm getting the impressions of a crossover between Nino Kuni, Shin Megami Tensei, and Little Goody Two Shoes. And who knows, it might be an absolute flop come its release. But from the trailers I've seen, I've been quietly impressed with the early showings. The art style has that sense of unease attached to it, it's got a solid turn-based system, at least on the surface. The RPG fundamentals seem to be there, and the story appears to be intriguing as well. I fully intend to give it a whirl this year, because if it is a sleeper hit, it deserves to have its name shared around. Next up is a series that needs no introduction to the wider JRPG sphere, and certainly not for long-time viewers of this channel specifically, with the 11th title in the Trail series and Trails Through Daybreak releasing in summer this year. It's the first game of the Calvert Arc and sees players take control of Van Arkride, a Spriggan who gets more involved with the world's underbelly. Trails Through Daybreak will introduce players to the land of Calvert itself, while also feeding into a singular story that connects in varying ways to previous titles. When it was first announced back in Japan for the end of 2020, it was a big deal. It was the first game of a new arc, a whole host of new characters, and of course the utilisation of Falcom's U engine for a full experience along with a redone combat approach. Now, being a Trails fan, I've already played this game from around two years back, and I've also played its sequel. And while I do have reservations for the second game, Crimson Sin, I've no doubt that the first one will resonate with many. And it's a needed title in many ways. While I wouldn't say it's the best starting point in the series, it will function as yet another gateway to the franchise, while also freshening up the palette for a formula that I felt was getting a bit stale come the release of Reverie, at least in terms of gameplay. I love what they came up with in Daybreak, and though I personally won't be playing it immediately upon release since, you know, I've already experienced it once before, I am hoping it will continue the upward trajectory of the series in the West for many more years, and I do intend to get to it sometime in 2024. Next up is a game that is intended to be the third pillar of Atlas alongside Persona and Shin Megami Tensei, yet time will tell if it manages to acquire that accolade. I'm talking about Project ReFantasy, or Metaphor ReFantasio as it's known now, releasing in fall this year. It's the first original title developed by the in-house Studio Zero, and takes place in a medieval European-inspired fantasy setting that is considered the mirror or altar of the real world. As per the tradition of many Atlas titles, it follows a self-insert protag who must embark on a journey to protect their kingdom while also overcoming numerous obstacles and forging alliances with many companions he meets along the way. Metaphor Refantasio looks bonkers, like that's apparent immediately from its trailers, but I'm really digging the look of the combat here. It appears to be drawing on the press turn system of SMT, but also incorporating action-based elements on the overworld before transitioning to the turn-based system, much like Trails Through Daybreak. I love that combat system, so more of that approach is always welcome. But it does seem to also be drawing on the strengths of Persona 2, at least in terms of those social links and the calendar system. 
Clearly Studio Zero decided to adopt that if it ain't broke don't fix it mantra. Despite those similarities though, I imagine this title will set itself apart in many ways from its Atlas contemporaries and bring something fresh to the table while also maintaining that seal of quality. Up next is yet another revisit to an older title, but good luck finding it at a decent price if you still have the hardware. It's the remake for Paper Mario The Thousand Year Door releasing this year. Originally released back in 2004 for the GameCube, it carries on the trend of classic RPGs getting an overhaul, much like Super Mario RPG back in 2023, which became one of the best games I played last year due in no small part to its charm and light-hearted feel. In this game, Mario teams up with various companions on a quest to discover the mysteries behind the titular Thousand Year Door. And that's it. Much like Super Mario RPG, it's the easiest of concepts to grasp, and is in many ways more about the journey than the end goal. I mean, what is not to love here? What is not to admire about this offering? It's arguably the most recognisable character in gaming, with a timeless art style and using an RPG foundation. Need I say more than that? The ninth title on this list is yet another game that I think has gone under the radar, but I've been drawn into what it's shown via trailers. It's an SRPG come deck builder hybrid called Cards RPG The Misty Battlefield. Developed by the ever recognisable Acquire, the minds behind Octopath Traveller, and it releases on May 23rd. Taking place in a war-torn land called Mistaria, players take control of a battalion and push through the mists on their way to the land of Faftania. This faction has managed to harness the power of chimeras through inhumane experimentation, thus giving them insurmountable power. The Klauswitz Battalion thus take it upon themselves to journey there and uncover the truth of their creation. As for gameplay, emphasis is put on deck building and customization, with the advent of around 50 different cards that you find throughout the game. Now I've no doubt that I've not sold it too well there, but it combines two genres that I enjoy, deck building and strategic gameplay and the fact that it's by a choir is an added bonus. If nothing else, I admire the simplicity. The title alone tells me everything I need to know before I even check out its Steam page. I'm not too sold on the art style, I will admit that it feels like the pro tags and enemies are from two entirely different games, but the gameplay itself looks like something I can latch onto, so even if it's destined to crash and burn, I'm willing to try it out before that hammer is thrown down. The tenth title on this list is one that has seemingly fallen off the face of the earth, but maybe this will act as a reminder to level 5 to give us an update sometime this year. It's for turn-based detective RPG Decker Police. While there was some confusion that the game is due to release after 2024, Level 5 immediately clarified the situation, stating that it has indeed been pushed back to 2024 and not beyond that, so that's at least reassuring. And thank God as well, because I've been looking forward to this one ever since it was announced. That being said, Level 5 clearly felt that the game needed more time in the oven, so if that means we get a better result by the end of it, I'm all for that, because this one looks like it has a bunch of potential. Players take control of the main character, a rookie detective named Harvard, while they arrest criminals in an open-world crime-ridden city, travelling back and forth between physical and virtual reality in order to solve cases via a system that recreates prior crime scenes that went unsolved. This system also acts as a 100% replication of the real world at a given point in time, meaning detectives can also use it to find clues to solve long-forgotten cases. It really looks like a fresh and novel concept, plus there's the pedigree of the developer too to aid it, so it's definitely ticking all the right boxes. Next up is the PS5 exclusive action RPG in Stellar Blade, releasing on 26th of April. Now some people will say it's made by a Korean studio, so what? Any game that draws comparison with Nier Automata, which I consider as one of the greatest action RPGs ever made, is going straight on my list regardless, and all the trailers till now have looked, pardon the word usage, stellar. The game is billed as a semi-open world game. Players take control of protagonist Eve as she and her allies attempt to reclaim Earth from otherworldly invaders, but they soon find themselves in the last remaining city of Zion. So it's got that post-apocalyptic feel to it, it looks absolutely amazing, in more ways than one, and the combat seems to be visceral, fast and challenging. My only real regret here is that it's a PS5 exclusive, so I'm likely waiting for a PC release here, which I sincerely hope is announced soon. I don't really have the desire to put 
research as a console that's in its final years of life cycle purely for a couple of games like this and Rebirth, and I'm certain that the latter will come to PC in the future anyway. There's been a fair amount of talk surrounding this game from various corners of RPG fans in regards to, say, the design of Eve herself and the lack of certain dubs, but what I have been drawn to were the responses from the developer. Everything he said just rung true to me. It doesn't sound like they're going to shift away from their core design philosophy to please anyone, and I think that will serve them well come its release. It shows unity in what they're trying to accomplish. No doubt, when I finally have the means to try it out, I will. Coming into the final three games now, and this one was announced very recently via the February Nintendo Direct in the Monster Hunter Stories Remaster releasing in Q2 this year. I've no doubt that had I not played Monster Hunter Stories 2 last year, I wouldn't be nearly as excited for this game as I am now. The second game ended up being a pleasant surprise for me, though it didn't end up on my best RPGs list for 2023, it did stand out to me as a game that was highly underappreciated. It's so much going for it in terms of the wide variety of monsters, how to raise them, traversing the world, and its story was actually fairly engaging too. And of course, being a sequel to that first game, there were characters showing up in Monster Hunter Stories 2 that also appear in the original with a greater focus. Much like the first game, it sports a self-insert protag looking for a monster egg along with their friends. They find a nest with one, and it hatches into a Raphalos that bonds with the protagonist immediately. They nickname the creature Rapha, much like the second game. Considering it was only on the 3DS before, this seems like a good time as any to try out the predecessor of one of the more unique RPGs I've played in recent years. Right, next up is an offering from Furyu that was noted as coming west this fall in Rain Artis. Set in a quote, painstaking realisation of the actual Shibuya, it's described as a game where magic exists and there are two protagonists who operate in different parts of the spectrum surrounding the magical world. You have one protag called Marin who wants magic to be used for ultimate freedom, while the other Sari wants it to be regulated in an ordered world. Naturally, these two ideals mix like oil and water, so you've got your conflict right there. It involves the likes of Yoko Shimomura for the OST, and it also brings in director Takumi Asobe, who worked on 2022's Trinity Trigger, also developed by Furyu. The trailers did everything they needed to do. They showed a flashy action RPG with an appealing art style and premise. That was enough to get me invested. And I should know better, especially because it's Furyu. Don't get me wrong, they make adequate games, but they're adept at making a title look better than it really is. Case in point, Cry Machina, that ended up being a disappointment for me last year, and also Trinity Trigger, that never really did anything special. Two perfectly serviceable action RPGs, but ones that offered a fairly shallow experience overall. A part of me is thinking that Rain Artist is going to be another one of those, but damn do they know how to advertise. I'll still buy it, and if I get bitten come this fall, then consider it another lesson that I won't learn from. And last for this list is a surprise, no doubt, as I didn't expect it to come till 2025 by the earliest, but I'll take it nonetheless. It's action RPG East 10 Nordics releasing in full this year. Now, if you ask me to rank these games in terms of which one I was most excited for, East 10 would no doubt be at the top of that list. It is the game I will buy on day one, and it will be the only game I'll play until I complete it. I love the East series, and everything shown concerning East 10 from its announcement back at the end of 2022 has just made me more and more intrigued. East 10 Nordics, much like Trails Through Daybreak, is a soft reset for the series, both in terms of gameplay and visuals. Initially, it will be the first East game to use that in-house engine, which allows for more involved and impressive cutscenes, some of which have already been experienced via those trailers. As for gameplay, up until now, the four most recent entries have utilised the party-based approach, those being East 7, Memories of Celsetta, East 8, and lastly, Monstrum Nox. East 10 is the game that changes that. It is something that the East series has done on a couple of occasions before. It runs a certain type of gameplay to its limits, and then it shifts away to something new. The Napishtim Engine games did it, the party-based games followed, and now we have this approach that I imagine will remain for the next two to three games if the pattern holds. And I think it will become the basis for a future remake of an older East title too. I'm personally thinking that will be East 5, which is the only one to not get that treatment as of yet. But back to East 10. Despite its number, it's touted as one of Adol's earliest adventures, set after the events of East 2, which means it takes place even before the events of Memories of Celsetta. So unlike in, say, Monstrum Nox, where we see an older and wiser Adol, this one sees a younger and more green adventurer around the guilds, and I'm looking forward to how that translates to this latest adventure. 
But then there's the more open world feel. The world is huge in East 10, referencing those maps, and you even get to control your own ship. I like the look of the gameplay. The new female lead in Kaja has the potential of being a fan favorite. There's just nothing that is telling me this will be bad. I firmly expect it will be one of the best games I'll play this year, and I am hugely looking forward to revisiting one of my favorite RPG series in the near future. Thank you for watching this video. If you liked it, please like and subscribe for more JRPG content and consider joining my Patreon if you're interested. Peace.